Good morning, everybody, and a very special welcome to our primary audience, Dr. Cheryl Ogilvie and the China University of Technology. Like Brudin said, we're going to extend a further special welcome to the CEO and COO of the Leadership for Conservation in Africa, Mr. Leon Uester and Mr. Chris Murray. Now, today we have the final talk of the Share Screen Africa Changing Hearts and Minds, Exploring Environmental Education in Africa. And as scientists, the most fundamental questions we ask in any research project is, what, why, when, how, and where? I hope that through this series, you've learned the value of what you are learning. That is not just what you know that is important, but what you do with that knowledge. Even more important than that is your why. Why are you doing what you are doing? Because the time to act is now. And so once again, in the words of our late president, Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Today, I am absolutely honored to introduce our speakers. Professor Jim Taylor worked for WESA for 35 years. For 20 of these, he served as the Director of Environmental Education. He is currently a research associate at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and founder member of the Global ESD Expert Net Program. He is passionate about education and transformation and has been active in key curriculum movements since the 1990s. His key interest areas include education for sustainable development, indigenous knowledge practices, and just transitions and social change and sustainability. He is an active supporter and participant of Fundisa for Change, as well as the UNESCO and Rhodes ELRC, supported sustainability starts with teachers capacity building programs. Jim is also the former president of the EEASA and founder member of the SEDAC Regional Environmental Education Program. This program supported ESD course development in 15 Southern African countries. And in addition to this, he is an honorary life member of WESA and is active in the work of UNESCO, where he is an advisor to the ASPNET Teacher Capacity Building Program. Now, Rob is a professor emeritus at the Environmental Learning Research Center at Rhodes University. In his handprint care work on environment and sustainability education, he has given close attention to the heritage knowledge practices in deliberative learning actions within post-colonial curriculum and community context. Recent work on ethics-led transformative learning has been undertaken within the ELRC T-Learning Research with the ISSC and an interactions on the handprint pedagogy of the ESD with colleagues in Mexico, Germany, India, Norway, Malaysia, and Japan. Now, in today's dialogue centered session, Jim will commence by reflecting briefly on the sessions that Share Screen Africa has presented over the past few months for the Environmental Education Series. He will emphasize a few key learnings from the sessions. He will then introduce Professor Rob, who will address the living landscapes of Southern Africa. So, ladies and gentlemen, our format today is a bit different. Instead of a separate Q&A, we are going to be interactive. So, please leave your questions in the chat as we move along. With that, everybody, get comfortable and let's use our energy for this deep dive. And with that, I hand over to you, professors. Great. Well, thank you so much, Aisha, and what a what a wonderful <laughs> um, introduction. As you we were speaking, it just struck me that Share Screen Africa could become the way of the future for conservation in Africa. 
you know, we have a way now of communicating across this beautiful continent. It's very inexpensive and it's a way of sharing the kind of knowledge and the knowledges that we're all learning about. So a huge thank you to um, Kirsten Yeke, Johan Kruger, Prudence and Cuomo, Ayesha Mawara for making this kind of forum possible for all of us. And Rob and I were just saying earlier that imagine if Share Screen Africa had been available when we started our career, what a difference it could have made. Um, we had to struggle along to universities, we had to sit in classes. Conservation might have been our passion, but it was always separate to the mainstream that we were embroiled in. And um, this kind of opportunity and the amazing sessions that you guys have all been through over the last six to nine months, it really sets up your, your future career. And always remember that one is as good as the people you work with. So what um, Screen Share Africa is doing is building the networks. It's building an astonishing community of practice, not only in Africa, in a way around the world. I see we have got people joining us from Europe, for example, in this session. So these are the people that you could work with for the rest of your lives. Now, how cool is that? So what I just wanted to do is reflect briefly on the sessions you've been doing and look at how the trends, what have been the trends that are shaping this field in, in Africa? The first one is communication. Of course, communication is critical, but in the past, it tended to emphasize messages at people. We were desperate to get messages to people about nature and conservation and sustainability. Of course, when you get messages to people, it's a bit top down. People usually get the message, but they usually do very little about it, usually nothing. So this work has shifted from communicating at people to communicating with people and more of a co-engaged um, kind of working. And that is just so um, revealing. It's so, it's so much more meaningful than receiving messages as you would from an advert on television. Um, Adverts tell us what you should do, you should drink this, you should drive that motor car and so on. Most of us just ignore them because we're so sick and tired of being told what to do in a top-down way. So communication has moved away to more co-engaged with people. Awareness raising was always emphasized and even activism to make people aware. There was big blame games. We were always trying to blame people for not doing this or not doing that. And that confrontation, often it raises people's blood pressure, and sometimes it makes them not want to participate. And they get sick of, um, I've heard people refer to them as greenies. You know, we're sick of greenies always telling us what to do. We really don't want that. If we're going to develop a sense of transformative agency, which is transforming the agency, the potential we've all got in us, if we can transform that, it'll happen through co-engaging and working together. Science was always expert-centered, from the expert to the public, and nobody ever reads all those scientific um, papers and all the theses, or few people do, but science is moving to much more a citizen science approach. Everyone is a scientist. We can all be better at being scientists. And giving away the tools of science or sharing them and sharing participation in science is much more powerful than um, science as the domain of the academics. Um, research used to be separate and academic, the thing that postgrad people did, um, like Dr. Cheryl Ogilvie, who is a key instigator in this series of programs. And thank you, Cheryl, for always being there for people and for sharing the science and the academic knowledge um, in a very human-centered way, a kind of way that's with dignity and re mutual respect, not something that happens over there in the academic ivory tower. And the research becomes situated, situated in the reality that people are living in. So those are just some of the, the kind of key shaping points. And 
Um, Rob and I intend to do this session with a little bit of dialogue. He's now going to introduce to you climate and the living landscapes of Africa. And he's going to start to share with you how we often think nature was over there, set aside in somewhere like the Kruger Park. Well, that's not really true. The people of Africa have shaped the living landscapes of Africa in many different ways, even those areas that are now um, set aside as protected areas like Kruger. They have all been shaped by human activities over hundreds, if not thousands of years. So Rob's going to introduce this, and he's going to use some tricky words or new words for us. And I'd urge each person to have a pencil ready. You can see I've got mine. Every time a new word appears, I write it down, and I try and make sure I understand what it means. As Rob introduces these words, I'm going to ask for explanations. So we're going to do a little bit of dialogue here. And I'm also going to be following the program on the chat and the Q&A on another laptop. So while Rob's speaking to you, if anyone asks direct questions, we'll have a go at answering them. And then we'll also bring some of those into the verbal narration so that others can benefit from them. So guys, great to be with you all. Remember, this is just the beginning of future journeys with us. Um, we're always available on WhatsApp and on email. And um, we'd love further dialogue with anyone who's excited and as interested in sustainability and future sustainability in Africa as Rob and I are. So with all that, over to Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, let me just uh, screen share. I've been preparing this for a conference in Norway um, coming up soon. And um, what I've been working on, uh, in, in part with uh, people in India and Engagement Global in Germany and colleagues in Mexico, is handprint care. And handprint um, emphasized the point that Jim made, that we need to be doing things together. We need to be learning together. And heritage-activated and ethics-led work is really important. So what I'm going to try to do is to cover um, heritage-activated learning. I'm going to look at the cultural processes of land um, taming in Africa, looking at seasonal phenology. Now, seasonal phenology is the cycles of the flowering and um, interactions uh, that happen um, during a year of seasons. And then we look at climate and living lands. So um, I've designed these so that I can end a, um, a series of just one slide, and then Jim and I can have a conversation about it. Um, so the question that I've been asking myself as an environmental educator is, can the inclusion of cultural phonology now, cultural phonology is looking at the way people lived on the land within the seasonal cycles. And some amazing work on this has been done um, in India. And this it is enabling us to get biocultural insights. In other words, what we're able to see is people and cultures and the biota, the living things, interacting. Um, and we're able to understand more deeply um, con um, conservation in Southern Africa, where Southern Africa does not have natural landscapes. Oh, you're probably shocked at that statement from me. Uh, there are no natural landscapes anywhere in the world, actually. Um, my son even went to Antarctica and says it's not natural down here. Um, because even Antarctica, and especially now, is being shaped by human influences. So the living landscapes of Southern Africa are biocultural landscapes. And we introduce these and the ecological concepts and sustainability concerns using um, environmental education or education for sustainable development, education for sustainability, and more recently, sustainability education. And in the work that we've been doing, it's on handprint learning. In other words, action learning and learning to change together. Rather than trying to change others, learning to change together. And that's um, a, an important um, distinction that we need to make. Okay, so folks, just Jim chipping in here. Just to be quite clear with the slide that Rob has in front of you, we've got biocultural sciences. 
Whenever you see the word bio, think life. Bio is life in Latin. So bio is life and culture is people. So we're looking at um, life and people, the sciences, and this idea of seasonal phonology is huge. Trust me, the next 10 years, phonology is going to be something that's very, very interesting because it's all about um, the climate climate change, but more than that, it's about seasons and how the seasons in Southern Africa shift from winter to summer, from the rainy season to the um, dry season. And Rob's going to demonstrate to us as we go forward how the phonology or the way the seasons work has enabled people to live healthily in Southern Africa. Of course, we've often degraded and reshaped these living landscapes. But the question is, what can we learn from the past and the histories of Africa and how people lived healthy lifestyles and how the ecosystems were quite healthy? Um, it's not to say there weren't challenging times. There were often times when people suffered enormously from wars, from disease, from uh, major climate events. So it's not to say it was all an era of peaches and cream, not at all. And yet there is so much wisdom from the past that has been suppressed and neglected in the colonial times. So we're going to pick up on that, those ideas and how the seasonal influences are, are so important as we learn to change together. The One of the challenges I've always had is we, we talk about environment from the sciences to the people. We don't work from African people's experiences into the sciences as much as we should. So African cultural phonology was a real eye-opener to me. And if we look at a brief history of the conservation ecology movement in Southern Africa, we can see that Jan Smuts was an early um, uh, protagonist in this when he called for holism. He wanted the sciences brought together into the field because he was a botanist and he was learning from um, the um, people who were looking at um, animals and trees and the ecological sciences grew and then proliferated. And we started to get nature-based conservation education and environmental education. And I've written very extensively on this. Then along came the environmental sciences after the Rio conference. And we started to get much more problem-based work that was coming out. And now we are in the era of climate change and sustainability sciences. And we're in this biocultural turning point where we start getting education for sustainable development and sustainability education that come through. So education has been on the slippery slope of responses to environmental degradation, where people are the cause in most cases, in many cases, with ecology revealing the problems and the wonders of the natural interdependence being brought out in the ecological sciences. So um, the, as Jim emphasized a little bit earlier, people became target groups for awareness creation and for conservation messages. And this is still around with us today where we're trying to create behavior change. Now, if we look at conservation education and environmental education, we can look at how do these um, emerge? And I wrote a PhD about this um, uh, about uh, 30 years ago now, probably, um, where I looked at the early environmental movements and they developed around a colonial fascination with wildlife. And it's not surprising when people still come to Africa for its wildlife. And with the scientific movements, we started to get scientific evidence of um, habitat degradation that produced environmental education. And um, it's at a time where there's this widening human condition of alienation within the modern world. So when the colonial pioneers found village communities on the Southern African upland landscapes, these were survival units surrounded by wildlife. 
what happened that has always worried me is it hasn't been so much about the people, but about the wildlife. And how can we bring the wildlife and people together in a discourse is the challenges that we have as environmental educators. So um, let's jump on now. And what I would like you to like to do is to introduce you to some early work that was done and reported by Maras in 1987, when they started to map on these upland landscapes, they found indigenous people had houses and gardens. There was a zone of permanent cultivation. There were zones of rotational fallow cultivation. There was a zone of shifting cultivation. And there was bush for hunting and collecting. So this was the colonial image, the researcher images of the Southern African um, upland communities. They weren't like this. And it's very important to be able to look at um, the work was, that has been done on um, the genealogical or the patterns of cultural development in Southern Africa by Chigwadere, and how they were networked of village communities as survival units living um, agroecologically on the landscapes. There was the agro, the agricultural side, there was the ecological side in their lives, and they were on these landscapes in um, Southern Africa. So if we were to build a more accurate picture of this, Chigwadere talks about taming of the land. And these were the sustainable practices and the land ethics of struggle that um, the uh, people enacted in the village households um, around important practices like the um, pastures for cattle, the Izala dumps where people um, dump, they had rubbish dumps just like we have today, but they're not full of, they weren't full of plastics. They have the arable lands, they had water in the villages, and there were these expanding agroecological cultural landscapes in Southern Africa, which developed around harvesting of imifino, the fires, the hunting and the grazing. And I'm sure you've got a clear picture of this out of the ecological work. Now, I want to go a little bit beyond the ecological sciences. If we take the Moyombo, the Moyombo woodland system, uh, the Makavisi is part of this and many other um, uh, habitat names are part of this. And what's important from a scientific point of view, that this is not a climate climax system, but a fire climax system um, with over 50 edible plant species and with fruits available throughout the dry season. Now, these two points were really important when you start looking at the pattern of indigenous people on this landscape. The savanna is not natural. Again, a real shock to many people. You know, the, there are no lateral landscapes. The savanna is not natural, but it manifests as a mosaic biocultural system. It's not just an ecosystem, um, ecosystem. it's a biocultural mosaic system. Because with three interacting habitats, you had the dense dry forests of the Miombo, you had the open woodlands of the Miombo, and you had the savannas of the Miombo. And they were all created because of the ecological dynamics within these systems. And human activity shaped these as living agroecological landscapes in Southern Africa. So you got these mosaics of Southern Africa being created by people over thousands of years. Rob, you often speak of the sort of agroecological landscapes and um, a mosaic to me is like a jigsaw. Um, an interconnected mosaic is lots of different things that come together. Do you want to just um, tell us why agro ecological and break down that word for us a bit. Yeah, agri agro is, comes from um, agriculture. And one of the real challenges in the sciences, we've had the conservation sciences, which are primarily ecological and environmental, and we've had agriculture. 
And we haven't yet in the universities, um, in the environmental sciences and in the sustainability sciences, we haven't yet been able to bring these together. And I hope that you recover from the shock that there are no natural landscapes and that um, we begin to understand that human activities, um, you have a thing called fire stick agriculture from the earliest peoples who hunted using fire. Um, then you had um, wonderful examples amongst the Ziwa in the uplands of um, the eastern part of Zimbabwe and um, the uh, western part of Mozambique, where people have lived for um, hundreds of years through um, moving rocks and um, creating a landscape where they could grow their food. So these agroecological landscapes is the nature of all of the landscapes of Southern Africa. From the earliest, um, what uh, Bushman San people, the Khoi people, um, and there's a very interesting book that you might like to read um, that has just recently come out. It's called The Lie of 1652, and it deals with a decolonizing history of land. And first of all, it decolonizes the idea of race, where people were much more like each other than different from each other. And what it does is it looks at the landscapes of Southern Africa um, through the lens of the importance of understanding it as agroecological landscapes. Is that helpful, Jim? No, re really excellent. And folks, um, if you see words coming up on the screen that you're a bit shy to ask about, do just put them into the chat or the Q&A, and um, we'll either elevate them into the verbal dialogue or we'll answer them directly to you um, uh, on, on, the, on the chat box. Thank you. Okay, so now let's get on to, um, here's a little seasonal cycle um, from the um, rains coming in September and October, later November, late rains, um, right the way through to um, March and April, and then the dry season. And if you take the Moyombo, which is one of the easiest ones to understand, then what you've got in November, December, and January, you've got some fruits and geophytes. Geophytes were really important for the earliest indigenous people. They were the um, plants that were edible, um, growing tubers underground, etc. Um, then you had the grasses for the cattle people. Um, very interestingly, most of the fruits are available in June, July, August, and September. Those are the dry months when um, there are no crops in the ground. And, um, and the time of the flowering as well. So that's like um, a little cycle. If we take the Mopani, and I've chosen these two in particular, because the Miombo is an upland um, system, and the Mapani is a lowland system. And um, if we look at the Miombo, the rain happens from October to April, and then the dry season is in um, May um, to um, August, September. And then September are the transition zones into the new rainy season, and the April, May is the transition into the dry season. If we take the Mapani, which is a, a low felt um, system, then what happens is you have the rainfall, the same, but it's drier down there. Um, you don't get the transition because um, you don't get early rains often as much as you do up. So you have a, a longer dry season. And what I'd like to do is to say to you, now imagine, let's look at the indigenous people living in this area. From September to October, they would be planting, but there wouldn't be food available. But look at the Miombo, it provided fruits and geophytes. For the cattle, the grasses were probably short in that period, except they'd come on with the green flush. And then there'd be a lot of grasses in February, March, and April. Um, but they couldn't go to the low felt because of the with their cattle because of the Nagana cattle disease. So in the low felt, what you had was lots of grasses, and that was mainly for the wild animals. Um, uh, as people 
um, couldn't bring their cattle down to disperse the wild animals. So you always had this um, nature reserve around people. And if you look at the Moombo again, what you had is look at the fruits available from um, July through to September, October. Those were the months where people stored their grain and they didn't use it. And then when they moved down into the low felt with their cattle, because the Nagana um, receded, the Nagana was in the moist woodland areas um, of the river Ryan systems, and um, it was carried by the tsetse fly, which fed on wild animals that were immune to it. And one of the most interesting things is that the rebuck is one of the only wild animals that can get the Nagana cattle disease. And that was a grassland species that now we find around cattle. And look also the fruits from May, June, July, August down in the low felt. So this is a, a picture that we could translate into. And the only um, uh, one that I could find was done um, for the, um, the area around Limpopo, which feeds into the Tonga system on the Yobombo, which Cheryl will be very familiar with. Um, and if we look at this, you can see that the wild fruits were harvested um, in the January, February, and October, November, December. Um, then the hunting occurred in this particular area um, around um, May and June, but throughout the year. Um, but those were the main hunting seasons because people had done their planting and the animals were um, available and not so much dispersed. Then we started to have pumpkins and calabash and maize. And if you go into this in some detail, which I won't do now, what you've got is this wonderful picture of cultural phenology, where people had built up on this landscape um, a way of life that was harsh, but it was African. And maybe what we can do is build um, a picture of African cultural phonology that we can use in environmental education. So this is a picture that really excites Jim. Um, it's of the African uh, landscapes, um, which, are, um, which is done climatically. Um, and um, what we're able to see here is that we've got the intertropical convergence zone in the north. Um, we have got the southern Indian Ocean system um, to the east. And we've got the um, southern ocean frontal systems that we're now experiencing here as we just had a cold front through. And then, of course, we have the um, cold current and upwelling on the west coast. <laughs> so naturally, through the climate, Southern Africa is an area of high climate variability. And therefore, we should be spending more time looking at the cultural phonology of the area and the ethics of land care of the um, early African people as a foundation for our environmental education work. And here again, look at our little picture again, people taming the land with the village households, doing everything that they can to create a living landscape. And what we've done is plotted some of these living landscapes in the archaeological and ecological records and um, started to explore the cultural phonologies in these areas, like the Ziwa, the um, earlier agroecologies in the Mpumalanga area, the um, uh, Moyombo, on the plateau, the uh, Tonga um, on the coast, um, and the um, Koza. Now, and there's a great potential for you as environmental educators to actually examine the living landscapes in your area and start to plot these particular um, patterns of social historical interaction over hundreds of years that have shaped the living landscapes of Southern Africa. And of course, we need all of our ecological knowledge to do this. Um, and we need a lot more cultural knowledge that was marginalized 
um, through the um, apartheid system and not really taken up into the academic work. And some wonderful work has been done by John, um, who's with us, I think. Yeah, John is here. Um, he talks about the idea of um, Afrophilia. And if you look at the um, cultural landscapes of Southern Africa, here he's uncovering the sort of moral imperative um, in a stewardship of love and respect that can be expanded to include the wider than human within a shared duty to activate change for a common good. So this is the Ubuntu, the Hunu Ubuntu uh, further north, um, which is the solidarity of sharing for a common good. Now, if we can build our programs around this and living landscapes, what we end up with is three interacting important areas. First of all, the idea of care, and that's what we've been working on in handprint. Then you have the knowledge component, where that's where all of your ecological and cultural knowledge comes in. And then you've got the agency, being able to do something about these things. And this is a form of stewardship. I've taken this from Inquist, the stewardship framework, and looked at how this gives people a care and knowledge, gives us a vision. That's different from awareness. Okay, Care and agency gives us an ethic of concern and care. And what we're able to then do is to look at action learning or handprint change projects, which is a form of land care stewardship. So you end up with EE or ESD on living landscapes of stewardship where we're learning to change together. And here is the active learning framework out of the handprint care where we can tune in around stories. We can do investigations or inquiry to find out more. We can deliberate and explore things together um, to um, work things out together. And then we can have change projects. And what's so important about this work that John is opening up is that when one takes, um, as we have done, John's work, and we look at it, um, story sharing becomes really important, um, along with um, inquiry, ecological inquiry, and along with doing things together. So you get these in these quadrants that unfold in a learning sequence. Um, and I've pulled this together around some work that was done by Smith um, on process sociology. And that is where he talks about individual action is creative in the sense that when I enact care for the other, I strengthen the tissue of interpersonal solidarity in which ethical behavior resides. And this is what John has been looking at, the ethics of um, African heritage and how these are about um, activating change and care for the common good. And then we can look at this, if it becomes an interpersonal solidarity, like amongst the Shona Hunu, the solidarity of building things together, then Interpersonal solidarity that has been lost in the modern world can be rebuilt and it becomes rebuilt around an active citizenship of reconstructed um, public work for a common good. And that's what so much EE and ESD has been centered on. So, John, um, if you're there, maybe you could chip in and share um, some of your work, but I just want to acknowledge the work that you've done and how important it is, and also the work of Lidis Madzima, who talks about solidarities and um, school success in her work. So now let's just get into the landscapes. This is a living landscape. Um, a living landscape um, uh, on the map, it's shown as woodland savanna. Um, it's the um, um, Makavisi in the Moyombo system. And People lived here, and uh, Sol Shava did some wonderful work on this. Um, immediately when Sol and, and um, also Tich Pesanai, when they introduced me to this landscape, they were just saying how wonderful it is. And I couldn't really see it, because I was looking through the eyes of a teacher, not the eyes of uh, a Shona person with cattle. And immediately, um, 
Titch told us a story, and the story told us about cattle grazing on the rich grasses under the tall trees. It's such a pity that all of these tall trees are being chopped down and made into charcoal these days. But this is where the brown cattle of the Chishona were sheltered under the trees during the um, uh, summer, and then they'd lose their leaves in the winter, and the cattle were kept warm. There were grasses under the trees during the um, uh, hot summer months. During the winter months, the cattle would venture out because the Nagana would allow them to move into the low felt. So the woody undergrowth was cut for firewood by people. It was left to dry in the winter months. And then it was burned to prepare the croplands. Of course, they have army worm there. So burning over the croplands was really important to keep army worm at bay and other pests. The heat of the ash would help control pests as well as provide nutrients for sorghum and other crops. And Titch noted how changing practices and demand for charcoal was leading to the loss of this system, this cultural system um, on a cultural landscape. So this is one example of this new work that was brought out by Titch Passanai that relates to the work that John has been doing. Um, and you can take this into finding out more about these cultures, looking at agroecological landscapes, and looking at sustainable habitats and food production, uh, using a, phenom um, a phenology to actually shape this. This work hasn't been done. We need more researchers to do this kind of work. Now come down to where I am at um, the Environmental Learning Research Center. This is an entirely different landscape, the landscape of the Poza. Notice again, it was forest and woodland, and it has been transformed into this living landscape of the Tosa as cattle people. And it's not a degraded landscape because they used to have the grasses, the sweet felt in the, in the summertime, and then in the, into the dry winter. Um, but if they had a drought, they would go down, cross over the um, uh, Case Kama River, and they would be in the um, area where the sand had lived. And there they had the sawfelt. Sawfelt grasses, very good during the rainy season, very highly nutritious during the summer. All the nutrients go down into the roots. So you had another agroecological system here that we need to explore. And here, um, if you take the um, imifuno, it was very, very important. There is work that you can look at around Orion's belt and um, the Ukugalesha practices of bringing water into the soil. All of these can be explored in environmental education. Now, a very exciting landscape. Again, um, I'm working with some people, um, and Cheryl probably has as well been up to this area. A young man is just so excited to teach me about his landscape and how the Tsonga um, did the fish trapping. But also what we often don't see is what was so important for the forested areas, because this was not a cattle area. This was a forested area um, where ecological work was um, uh, done by Tony Cunningham. And Tony, at the end of his report, before he left to teach in Australia, um, he wrote, about, you know, as ecologists, we haven't given enough attention to the cultures of the peoples living on the land and how the landscape speaks to those cultures. For example, the Tsonga, when they pick the marula, when it's rich, uh, when it's ripe, they pick a branch of marula trees, uh, marula fruits, and they take that home and they make marula wine. Um, which is a rich, nutritious food. And of course, the marula, because of the way people picked, produce bigger fruits. So now if you go into parts of um, the nature reserves, you find as you're walking on a trail, oh, this marula tree has got big fruits. You look around, you can see, ah, oh, this used to be uh, a landscape in which people, villagers lived. 
And because they picked the trees, they actually produced the bigger fruits. So all of these factors are important. And Tami, who I've been working with, talks about the fishing, and we could explore the fishing and the relations with the mangroves, etc. This is the Ziwa. Look at the extent to which early people have actually um, put agriculture um, down in terms of these terraces. We find the same in the Mpumalanga area. Not enough work has been done on these landscapes, these living landscapes of upland forest, which become mosaic um, landscapes. Um, again, the same cultural processes and the stone wall settlement stories can be told, particularly by Chigwedere about the Kalinga um, and the Kalanga and the Ziwa. Um, and this is where I really felt at home when I was doing conservation with um, Ezenvelo KZN Wildlife. This represents the grasslands of Zululand. Um, and I always tell this wonderful story when I was doing my research there that I came across these pictures of Shushui, which is now forest. And it was completely grassland, wall to wall grassland. And that grassland had been created as the cultural landscape of the Zulu as cattle people, right the way down into Yumfalosi, which is now a mosaic system. And we do artificially manage that mosaic system when it had become a mosaic system um, out of the coastal forested areas and the upland um, grasslands of, on the escarpment. Um, so here you can tell many, many stories. The one I enjoy, which came out of the work of Magema Fuse, was the story of the Nagana and the way people managed to protect their cattle. Also the story of cholera and migration to this coast. But all of these stories are um, around now. And what we need to do is we need to capture them and bring them into maybe a shift in thinking towards cultural landscapes in our environmental work, much more around climate change. So we should be sort of wrapping things up now. So Jim, you've probably got some thoughts, but I do want to acknowledge all of the indigenous scholars that have been part of this. Sol Shava, who I've mentioned, um, Charles Chukunda, Mongi and Charlie, Bamangele, Masugu, Kalamandi Konza, who's now on sabbatical, he works in um, um, in Witz. Um, Titch, who unfortunately left us, um, and Ken Poza, so many people, Mutizwan Kute, Chris Masara, um, Robson Moyombo. There's a tremendous amount of scholarship that is being done by indigenous ecologists and environmental educators. And we need to try to bring this work more into the work that we're doing together in our areas. Heritage knowledge needs to be reflected in our work. And um, we are trying to bring this out in the handprint work. Um, but let me leave it there now, Jim, yeah. and um, allow you to pick up um, with this work. I noticed you didn't interrupt me much, so you must have been happy. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you so much, Rob. And thank you for acknowledging gratitude for all those folk who um, go before us. And as Rob said in his PhD, you know, none of this work is original. We've just been fortunate to stand on the shoulders, in some cases, of many great people who've tried to foreground the, the rich heritage of Africa. And often that was at odds with what's considered modernism, you know, if it's not modern, it can't be good. You can walk around with a laptop in your briefcase, but um, is that what we all aspire to? Or wouldn't it be wonderful if we understood our heritage? And in fact, you can't eat from your laptop, but you can live from the landscapes, the living landscapes that support animals, plants, and people. And we're not doing enough to care about them. We're not doing enough to understand them. And isn't it marvelous? I think we have Susan Pan James with us, who's setting up a new program for grade sixes to go into parks like Kruger, Amphalosi, and Steinbank near Durban. And isn't that absolutely wonderful? Just like Cheryl Ogilvie, Dr. Cheryl Ogilvie, who has students all over South Africa, 
and she shares with them and they share with her. I believe on today's program alone, we have over 64 students who are part of us. And to all of you, we say, guys and ladies, this is the future. And what's happening now is we go into a post-climate change world where we're trying to live less on fossil fuels. Um, what better thing to do than bring out the wisdom of the past, the wisdom of the great heritage of Africa, link it to the wisdom of the present, and overcome the colonial disruptions that have interfered with this knowledge sharing um, over time, and the climate change disruptions where we've overused the fossil fuels to the detriment of life on Earth in many instances. And, and finally, while we're on the expressing gratitude, again, to thank Dr. Cheryl Ogilvie for helping put this program together, Kirsten Nerke, Johan Kruger, Ayesha Mubara, and Prudence and Korma. These people are working with Share Screen Africa to share this deep wisdom using the latest possible technology, but not being beguiled by it, enabling it to share and develop that sense of agency and transformation in in a challenged world. So to all of you, thank you. And thanks for those of you who participated in the chat. It was so good just interacting a bit with you. We loved it. Don't forget, you're always welcome to phone us, WhatsApp us, or email us if you want to take any of these ideas further or get linkages to the great people that Rob acknowledged. And I know John Burakeni is still with us. Um, for example, we can put you in touch with John, and he's always ready to share with anyone in that great spirit of Ubuntu of Africa. Thank you all so much for being with us. And I think I'll hand back now to Ayesha to, to perhaps round things off or take us from there. Yeah, we can maybe do some questions or um, have some reflections. I see Prudence is on, on air there. Prudence. What would you like to do next? <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. I'd like to say thank you, Jim and Rob, for your for your very insightful talk. Um, I think it 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 shed a lot of um, and piqued a lot of interest for me in in the stuff that you do. Um, in knowing that uh, you also do some anthropological work, so it, it's always interesting to see the work between the environment and society nexus. Um, I will like to open the floor for questions now. I think some of the students in the class, Dr. O, might have questions. So we can take questions from the students in the class. We can take questions from anybody in the chat that has some questions. You can write them. You can raise your virtual hand and we'll address that. I think the students are making their way to the screen and then they will ask you the questions and then you can interact with them. It's been great being with you all and so good to see so many fellow professional environment educators joining us. We have, for example, Janet Snow are, are live with us and Janet has been working extensively with teachers around Fundisa for Change. Fundisa for Change means learn for change. And how wonderful is that, um, that, um, that teacher support program? And then going broader into Southern Africa, is the one Rob mentioned, SST or Sustainability Starts with teacher, Teachers, which is a UNESCO-initiated program that um, is working with the Rhodes Environment Learning Resource Center to support teacher learning. So, yeah, and thanks for those of you who participated in the chat. The yeah. There is a recording, and um, we can always pick it up further later. Back, back to you, Prudence. <laughs> yes. Um, just before the class goes in, we would also like to give a warm welcome to, as we'd mentioned earlier, our CEO joined us uh, during the talk. And so we'd like to thank Mr. Leon uh, for, for coming to see some of the work that we do. And it, it's it's very nice to have you here. So thank you. Um, we can take a question from the class. Oh, good morning. Hi. My name is Tasha Matebula. 
It's a great right. start. It's a very great start for the morning. Thank you so much for the talk. Like myself, I heard you mentioned uh, that that landscape was first grassland, yeah? but now it's turned into a forest. Was it done intentional or it just uh, those trees, they invaded that area? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, because um, if you look at the climatic map that I showed you, then um, it's forest. And of course, when the um, Zulu nation expanded and the cattle expanded with the Zulu nation, for, for instance, if you look at the area of Flabisa, Flabisa down into Shrishtuwe and into um, Umfalozi, then what you get is the grassland of the uplands having coming down. And when the Nagana disappeared, there was a lot more cattle able to come in. And of course, there was a proliferation of wildlife. So what you had in that soil was all of the seeds of the trees going back. And that's one of the very interesting points about most ecological habitats is the seeds stay for decades in the soil and they can come out, especially if you look in the savannas. Um, they were produced by people burning, by people, cattle and by wildlife. So you often have what happened in Shishlui was all of the seeds in the soil take away the cattle okay, and, and decrease the ungulates. Um, the forest comes back. So we haven't done enough work on the dynamics of these. And the ecologists in the Shishliyom Falozi are trying to create what they call mosaic landscapes to support wildlife. Because we cannot let the wildlife um, survive with people pressing in on them. And people need to have their cattle. So this is the area that so much conservation is happening. And if we recognize that the landscape of the Shishu and Falozi was a cultural landscape, how can we get the balance today is the most important question. Can we have forested areas that maintain the biodiversity? Can we look after pastures around the um, Shishu area? And can we see that if areas are converted um, to grassland, that the indigenous forests will come back because the seeds are in the soil. So in the long term, we have got quite a big challenge of reconciling, keeping biodiversity. And just as a little joke at the end, if I asked you, which is the area of the highest biodiversity in the world these days, according to ecological scientists, you'll be really surprised that it might be the cities. The cities are now showing the highest biodiversity because, of course, many of the natural landscapes or the landscapes that were not impacted heavily by cultural change um, were um, low in biodiversity because as you get to a climax, you often lose biodiversity. So you're, um, I can see that you're working in conservation and you've got to just keep on asking these questions. There is no answer that I can give you. But if you're working with children, trying to learn about forest landscapes, particularly in that area of Flushliwe, one of the best things to do is to say, the Zulu had created it as a grassland landscape. Um, and that's why the white rhino of Ian Player's Day were so prolific, because they can support the tall grasses. Um, you know, so... It's just a wonder to me that we have got the science and we've got the heritage that we can use to explore these habitats and understand deeply and then start making decisions. How can we keep people surviving well and how can we keep the biodiversity and not have the conflict across the fences? So I hope you're going to take up that job and use your knowledge um, to explore those questions. It's not, is that the answer that you were expecting? <laughs> you, you answered it exceptionally. Thank you, Mr. Tim. And my last thing, suggestion, you know what? As Blacks, 
thank you so much for the founder of the share screen lca because i heard you saying it's 60 69 months now it's almost to six years now please if you are now wanting to update it please be generous with us you see because it's this communication is very sometimes it can be a barrier. You see, if it can have like trans transcript tra transcript is it transcript? Yes, when you are talking, it is going to be very 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 easy for us. You see, please thank you so much. Have a great day, Fedam. Yeah, um, I can record the detail of this that I jumped over, um, and share it out afterwards um, once I've uh, done the presentation at the conference in Norway. And this work, of course, is not only being done by us. It's quite wide work that we all need to be engaged in. Thank and you for that. Johannes, thank you for those questions. And Johannes just said in the chat that the recording on this session will be available within seven days. So you can get it from there. Um, yeah. Next question. Next question or prudence. How are we doing here? <laughs> we take so we take a few questions from the class, then I'll read a few from the chat, and then we revert back to the class until we get to the end. Super. Uh, morning, Prof. How are you? Good. Uh, uh, thank you for the great talk. I just wanted to ask. So, there's a lot of indigenous knowledge about the lands, about areas that we are just sitting on at the moment. It's because it's not in writing or it's not in a paper, we not we don't look at it because it's not seen as viable sources of information. So I just wanted to ask, how do we go about actually getting these indigenous sources of information seen as credible and like actually starting to use them in conservation? Because at the moment we just look at them and say, oh, you know, that's a old wife's tale or whatever. So I just wanted to ask how we act, how can we get this information and credit it and then actually use it moving forward, if that makes any sense. Uh, the most important thing to me is that we need to change the biological sciences. Okay, and that change is happening. As I described, after Rio, they became environmental and now they're becoming sustainability sciences. So we need to become much more multidisciplinary. Um, what I've been doing as an environmental educator is I've been looking at um, archaeology, anthropology, cultural anthropology, and uncovering this work. And then when I take it to the people in the area, then they tell us the stories um, that relate to the way the ethics of land care worked. So that what we are trying to do, in my opinion, is we're trying to build an African um, environmental science for learning together in Africa. We're, we're not just trying to bring the knowledge of the sciences. We're actually trying to build a social science of African phenology is where we're starting, I think. And I've done very little work on this. I'm very excited by the work that's been done, trying to gather it together, because African phonology is a foundation for learning for future sustainability. When it combines with the ecological sciences, we have got a double whammy of African knowledge that can actually be deployed to solve the problems for the future in just and sustainable ways. You know, so you need to be an ecologist, you need to be an anthropologist, you need to be an archeologist, okay? And you need to be able to work in ways that combine African knowledges to produce sustainable and just futures. And I think that's the journey that we're on together. Thank you so much, sir. Have a great day. Um, good morning, Prof. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Okay. Um, you, you've mentioned the uh, concept of Afrophilia, um, the love of Africa and being African. And I was there wondering now, by African, do you do you only mean the Zulus, the Tsongas, 
because I mean, I'm African, Dr. Ogilvy is African, the both of you are, are African. And I think uh, because not everyone sees it uh, that way. So my question is, how do we get the people to see it as, 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 as being one? Because I believe living, living in harmony with each other uh, will will in turn be living in harmony with our resources, with our, our land use, because it tends to segregate uh, our views and 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 land use, which which creates I which I think creates a conflict and leads to these kind of uh, um, different views on land use and segregation in a way. So how do we get people like people out there? to see it how we see it. Maybe we could bring John in here, if John was able to come online, um, because he's done some work on Afrophilia. Um, but from an ecological point of view, what I could add is that, do you know that the colonists who came to Africa would not have been so successful if Africa had not been welcoming? I, I'm very glad that you called me an African. Okay, I actually come from Ireland, but I feel an African because I've grown up here. But I can only feel an African when someone like you recognizes me as an African. And that's what Africa did. It sort of brought people in. It enabled people to come together. And John's work on Afrophilia is really important. And um, yes, we've had a very turbulent history in Africa. And your question is very, very well received, that people are not going to see it that way. Um, the book that I mentioned is The, the Lie of 1652. What this guy does is he goes into all of the genetics of African people. And we think of the Khoi, the San, the Zulu, the Sutu, and we see them all as different. But if you actually look at it from a genome point of view, and if you take pictures of people that you call Zulus, they don't look the same because they're not all the same. And the cultures are not separated from each other. That was a, uh, an unfortunate period of history where people were seen to be different and they were labeled by race. Okay, we need to actually see how Africa was the melting pot for humanity in the genome sense. And even in our recent history, People are all Africans because they share a common root and they share a love. And that's what John is. is have you been able to bring John on? Is he, is he there? And he could maybe answer your question more directly. No, he's yeah, not John, John oh. is struggling with his signal. Oh, pity. But um, I think you, you, you're so welcome to um, make oh. contact with him and we can share his details. That's very easy. But... I wanted to say you must there's a deep sense of pride in how you've spoken um about being African. And like Rob, um I'm just so grateful you see me as African. Never forget that all the people on earth came from Africa. Africa is the the true home where we all came from in the first place. Isn't it likely that solutions to the world's problems are also going to come from Africa. Not only does Africa have some of the greatest biodiversity on earth, but it also has so many things. It has connections with indigenous practices and knowledge that no other continent has. It also has a geophysical stability that you generally don't find in the rest of the world. You know, we're not overwhelmed by cyclones. Well, not yet, but it just shows that Africa is the most wonderful place to live on earth. And Africa has that sense of warmth and hospitality that um, can be the actual, um, the learning space into which we can bring these great ideas. So you know, absolutely lovely to hear you speaking so well about this great, these great things. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, thank you. Siabonga from TUT. Hello, everyone. Hi. 
Um, okay, so my question today is, um, how can we get more postgraduates to be involved in citizen science projects? And also, um, the, from what I know, the, um, the project is about volunteers and scientists working together. So my question is, uh, people who are illiterate and who have zero uh, information regarding the environment, are, are they welcome to volunteer and work with the scientists? Gosh, well, well done for flagging citizen science. Yeah. And in a way, citizen science is a reaction to top-down science. And it's a reaction to ivory tower science that only happens in universities. And it's a way of involving people. Whether they've had a university education or not is not important. But I would like to mention a paper by Rabeck, uh, a, a Danish guy. And in it, he proves how powerful and authentic and rigorous citizen science is. And the way he does it is by saying, if you get multiple observations of one issue, it's much more rigorous and scientific than if you just have one. So if, for example, we are studying the water, quality of water in South Africa, um, through projects like Minisas, we now have a Google Earth map with over 4,800 contributions from citizen scientists. And that was all for free and for the benefit of the land. Now, can you imagine if the government had to fund qualified scientists to go around collecting all that data? It would be far too expensive and there wouldn't be time to collect it. So what Rabeck does in his statistical analysis is he demonstrates reliability and rigor through in citizen science according to the numbers and the contribution. And he also has a, um, a, a bell curve that he uses to exclude the outlying data so that it doesn't interfere with the rigor. So more and more good scientists are showing how rigorous and powerful citizen science is, but even better than that, and this is underneath what you're saying, better than that is it's about people involvement. When people become involved, change can happen. If people are just listening, little change will happen. Sometimes no change, but involvement, engagement, and participation is what it's all about. And citizen science is a fantastic vehicle for that. So anything you can do to encourage others to involve themselves in citizen science will be so good for people and for the planet. Yeah, can I just take up one point with you, and that is um, a, a very, very important point, um, is there's no one with no knowledge. I've never met a person, you know, but in schools, what we're taught is that the ecology that we learn makes us special, and that we've got knowledge, and other people don't have it. You know, even if you meet um, a person who's lived, um, can't speak your language, um, they have got amazing knowledge that needs to be recognized. You know, I've um, worked with uh, people, um, like I had some Koza friends who were working with San up in northern Namibia, and they were working in the desert areas, and they don't say much. But if you can approach people with respect, you immediately see that these people have this tremendous knowledge that they're willing to share. And I think that, that the point from your colleague earlier was Africa was always a continent of where people were willing to share. And by them sharing, we've learned amazing things about African cultures, about African hands, landscapes. And now we can start weaving those cultures and landscapes together in the work that we're doing. But we must always recognize the knowledge that people carry by being African. And if we give them the opportunity to share their knowledge, we will always be enriched. Thanks for your question. Noted, thank you. Um, good day, everyone. Good day. Um, my name is Fuka Mackens. I'm doing nature conservation here at UT. I've got a question. Um, 
what is a proactive approach to conservation and how do we get people to become more proactive in conservation and in wildlife? I would say doing exactly what you are doing, um, you know, to, to have a chance to study at a great institution like TUT and with the kind of access you've got to lectures and field work and field studies, there are not many places on earth where people have that same benefit. I doubt that the people who study at the Ivy League universities in America like Harvard will have as grounded and as situated a learning experience as you and your colleagues are getting in and around Pretoria and in the field visits that you're doing. So I would just redouble my efforts to make the most of the learning you do have and be proud to know that you one of the you're at one of the finest institutions, certainly in Africa, if not anywhere on earth. Yeah, and take your question very literally, pro active. Okay, so Jim's point that he made earlier about agency being able to do something. You've got to try and do something to become good at it. You know, so yeah. when you're doing your teaching, if you can invite people to build conservation um, of soil gabions and things like that, that is pro-action, you know, because you learn by doing. And I think this is one of the key things in the heart of the early environmental education is that you go and you are in the real world, you're doing things together, and therefore learning is happening. So I really like your question. Proactive, we not, I shouldn't have people listening to us only, but we should have people bringing their ideas and their doings into the situation. So I really appreciate your question. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Hi. Um, my name is Asima Ali Makunda, and I'm a second year student at CUT doing nature conservation. Um, so I actually have two questions. The first one is a bit controversial, controversial right? So um, as we all know that poaching is basically wrong, right? However, in what can I say, in nature reserves or in the game reserves, we find that um, tourists will come from different places to come and hunt for a specific animal, let's take for example, a rhino, and it would only take the horn maybe for monument um, purposes. Then you'll find another person from the community hunting that same rhino, however, he's doing it for survival purposes. Um, the first one who's the tourist gets away with it free because he paid for it. Whereas the community guy who's doing it for the, um, who's doing it for like a purpose, um, like, you know, point of view, and it's gonna eat every single meat from the specific animal, is um, basically taken to court or beaten up so badly and um, all sort of. So why is it that it's, what can I say, different between these two people? Yeah, that's what is called dialectic, where you oppose ideas. And um, uh, often those ideas are not easy to solve. Um, I would propose that you reframe your question, because if you go back... Um, to the framing of the game laws by um, the colonial government. What happened in the framing of the game laws is they created the problem that you are now um, producing. Because the, if you look at the um, phonological cycle um, or the cultural phonology of the Zulu, and if you take the example of King Shaga, and if you look at the Mfolozi area, uh, of course, I know these areas quite well, having worked for 19 years for Isambardo KZN Wildlife. Then you have the Shaga hunting pits. And when he was building his armies in the um, for during the Imfakani, what he did is he trained his armies down in that area. But it represented an extreme event. In most cases amongst indigenous peoples in the early days, before the game laws, they would go and hunt at the times that food was short. 
and they wouldn't hunt at the times, if you look at the picture that I showed you, where at the times that they were busy producing food. Because if they didn't produce food and they spent their time hunting, then they would starve. So it was really tough. Now, when the game laws came in, in Zululand as an example, and there are many examples elsewhere, what you find is this anomaly where the Zulu wanted to hunt because it was the time for hunting, and the game laws stopped them hunting, and it became a punishment, and poaching was therefore created because the cultural mm -hmm. practice was not mediated. So I think if you keep on asking these questions, there aren't really answers to them unless you go back in history and show how the oppression of the phonological cycle in Zululand produced the problem of today, along with the conservation degradation that happened as populations have increased and as people were pushed into homelands. So you really need a, a wider picture of the social ecology and politics to be able to answer those questions. You know, I really think that we've got a major challenge in keeping to um, wanting conservation to be supported by all of these people flying in planes to Africa to go on safari or to come to Africa to hunt a rhino, or to come to Africa to hunt. Because what's happening there is they're using fossil jets, they're producing a false economy, and when they don't come, then Africans suffer. So you've got to just keep on asking these questions to which there are no answers, and around which a wider view begins to open up. How did the colonial game laws produce the problem? How did the degradation of Africa produce the poaching problem? How can we resolve it with maybe looking at phonologies in Africa and looking at African ethics that we can begin to open up these questions in particularly interesting ways? So a difficult answer to your question, complete in um, uh, not an answer to your question, but I think that that kind of question is a great debate for your group. Mm -hmm. So throw it up in the air and debate it as conservationists. There won't be an answer, but if you've got glasses that look wider and deeper, then I think you can get a grasp of it's all down to um, uh, an ethics of choice and meeting the challenges of the people and nature. So it's a biocultural challenge that you're raising that needs to be debated and needs to be resolved in different ways in different community settings. Okay, and then the last question I wanted to say, um, so, you know, in protected areas, um, like after they brought the protected areas like um, into the ads, right, fences were basically put up. Would you say that it is a physical barrier for communication between the community people and the managers in that game reserve? Um, in the early days of the Nagana, it was a necessary barrier. And if you look all over Central, Eastern and Southern Africa, um, you have the game fences were originally put up to try to keep the cattle separated from the Nagana. As the Nagana has receded, then the fences ceased to be um, to do their functions. And now they are... Um, necessary um, differentials if we're going to save biodiversity. So that the actual fence becomes the start of communication rather than a barrier to communication. You know, because if we take the fences away um, in, in some areas, we're going to lose the biodiversity. So what we've got to do is to look at maybe the fence as a starting point for communication that is wider and deeper than just simple opposing of nature and people. We need a new, and it's emerging, the new biocultural fields, the new biocultural research is opening up the, um, these questions that you're answering much more deeply and producing in us 
the tools to be able to communicate and use the fence as a starting point for communication. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Asima. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time because we have the students until 11.30. So I have to do the unpopular thing of asking um, that anybody else who had a question in the chat, we acknowledge them, Emmanuel Selo. We will get um, Jim and Rob to get back to you and they'll respond. Um, and any other further questions, we will get them responded back to you by email. And we have invited Rob and Jim to come and have an Unlocking Nature talk with us. So we'll have a, a larger discussion and we'll have more time to talk to them at another time. Okay, Prudence, just keep Blaine a few minutes, uh, a minute. A few minutes. <laughs> One. <laughs> Uh, morning, Profs. I just want to say on behalf of TUT, um, everyone in the class, um, I, I can't really express how much we appreciate you, your time um, and the old school knowledge that you're able to depart on us that we can kind of use. Um, it's it's just it's a valuable resource. And um, I just on, the, on behalf of TUT, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Blaine. And then from me, um, my two idols, you've always been there for me and I've been trying to fill your shoes for so many years and I think I'll never catch up. You guys have got so much knowledge. Um, we need many more of these talks and hopefully one day I'll make you proud. But slowly I'm getting there. Um, Rob, just to go back a few years back, remember I asked a question. So um, I was about in 1989, I said, um, so please, I'm from Saker Bush Runt and I don't understand the jargon. And remember, you said to me that next paper was, Cheryl, I'm going to go down to your level today. <laughs> and you did. You've been always been going down to my level, but it's time I climbed those steps and went up to yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for what you both of you have done today, Jim. It was a great catch up. And I've learned a lot and my students have learned a lot. And all what I can say is a big, big thank you. And this was a great ending to the series. We've had 13 talks and we put a lot of effort into it. Kirsten, Johan, Aisha, uh, Mariette, we have put so much effort in making this the um, series for share screen. And I would like to say thank you. You actually were the cherry on the cake today and you rounded it off so well and you put everything into it. And once again, I learned from my legends. That's what I call you guys, because I've got to, I've still got to follow you. I've got to follow you and I've got to climb those steps one step at a time. And I will eventually get there, but give me my baby steps and I will eventually catch up. <laughs> Thank you to both of you for doing this for me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, shot, um, Cheryl, and I know we the time is done, but remember, we started this by saying Share Screen Africa is a new media, a new forum for engaging Africa in African solutions. And we didn't have this forum when Cheryl and Rob were talking at Circobos Runt in the 80s. Now we've got it. And look at this. We can share, we can engage, we can interact. And it's not using media in that typical top-down advertising way. It's media to engage. So. Huge thank you to Share Screen Africa as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rob and, and Jim. I think with that, our two words for the day is Afrophilia and multidisciplinary research. But before we go, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Kirsten Nikke. Thanks, Prudence. Um, yeah, I think Cheryl said a lot of um, of, the, of the things that I was going to say. Um, I just want to say, Robin and Jim, you're an amazing team. Well done today for for making it all happen. Um, it was a fantastic conclusion to the environmental education series. I just think that you're both wonderful thinkers and activists. Um, and I think we all look up to look forward to the next episode on Unlocking Nature. Um, Cheryl, I just wanted to say thank you as well. You've been my partner in crime, or let me say partner in inspiration for the series. And I just want to thank my team and also uh, again to Chris and Leon. Uh, without you, Share Screen Africa would not be here. So um, yes, thank you to all of you. Uh, Rob and Jim, it was amazing. Thank you.
home. <laughs> and with that said, everybody, we've come to the end of the series and at the end of today's talk. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Um, we will hopefully connect again on other talks and cheers to multidisciplinary research. Enjoy the rest of your day.